Say, say that last statement again. Buyers do not want to pay for clients that may or may not stay with the firm. So I want to start with the concept of hire versus acquire, because the most explosive growth you may see in your law firm often can come from an acquisition rather than doing it organically. Um, so uh, I, want to, I want to first kind of uh, talk about, Sheila, I want to go into the weeds of what are the risk management criteria for someone potentially looking to buy a law firm and then what what uh, is the exact step-by-step -step process? Bill started off in a great way. Why would you want to do this? Typically, fill gaps in the business that you already have uh, to add a bigger depth of service, uh, more attorneys to do the same kind of work. Maybe you want to grow geographically. We're looking to acquire firms in the Midwest who also do either tech startup or mergers and acquisitions. So we're looking to grow instead of just hiring as well. So um, maybe you're at the end of your uh, practice life and you built this great practice and you want to you know take your chips off the table so there's a lot of reasons to you know merge or grow or acquire another law firm such a good point so let's go through kind of valuation factors um you know i think this is more of an objective question um but what are the valuation factors in general of a law firm uh or any service-based business I think there's two sides of this question. A, it can allow us to start thinking as law firm owners how we want to build a more valuable practice, but also in the case we decide to acquire a law firm, we can also vet out whether the firm that we're considering acquiring has the criteria that we want to see in it. Right. So the good, there's good news and bad news about growing a law firm practice. The good news, it's like a great life. It's intellectually challenging. The bad news is the multiples are, and the valuations that you get for law firms are far lower than some other practices. So we're going to address that too, if you don't mind, Bill, not just the valuation, but yep. kind of some other things. So there's a lot of different asset methodologies. Typically um, on larger firms, there's something that's called free cash flow. Like how much do the partners take out of the business? There's typically some adjustments to that. You might apply a multiple of you know up to three for that kind of thing but unlike most other businesses law firms are valued on revenue and it can be as low as 0.5 times your five-year annual revenue to three times so law firms don't come with super high multiples in comparison if you were selling a software as a service kind of product you'd be getting like you know 12 to you know 9 to 17 depending on how large you are. So you can see law firm service businesses, accounting firms typically sell for a similar 2.5 times revenue. So those are back of the envelope uh, kind of numbers. And the true thing in all MA deals is you will sell for the price that you have a buyer who is willing to pay you for. So it's always highly subject to negotiation as well. But if you have a very successful, for example, PI firm or a lot of, cases in your pipeline or you had huge mergers and acquisitions you might have uh, 0.3 times or three times revenue plus a percent of the case work that's going so for example if you're a pi firm and you had 10 huge cases that might settle for each 50 million dollars and they were 50 percent done when you sold the firm you would get you, you could negotiate to get 50 percent of the revenue on those cases so there is going to be some case value that you're going to get at the back end as well and so there's a lot of flexibility about how you value firms and how you might get paid out, especially if you have cases that might take some time, like mass torts or something like that. Yep. So question on that. So just to clarify for everyone listening, I'm, I'm going to slow you down a little, okay? What? And, and everyone's retaining it. Okay. So when you said 0.5 to 3x, you were referring to the- Gross annual, revenue. The, you said five year though. But five you, year average, take the last 12, five years of your practice. I will slow down. I talk so quickly. I apologize. And I can talk about good. this all day. That's my job. Uh, Go ahead. Okay. So five times. So take your five years, last year's revenue. And if you're working with Bill Hauser, going up. So uh, divide that by five and then multiply uh, 0.5 up to three times that number. So now. Got it. So five-year average of gross revenues multiplied by something between, let's say, two and a half, two, two, two point five x as a ballpark, right? Now, 
in terms of increasing that multiple, are there, like, for example, if a firm is doing over $10 million, I would assume there would be a higher likelihood that their multiple would be higher. Similarly, if they had a better SEO or internet presence that was yes, predictable, yes. that would increase the multiple. If they had a high year over year growth rate, um, I assume also that that would increase potentially that multiple. Uh, would you agree with my list of three things? And is there anything else I'm missing? Uh, one is client stickiness. Do you have ongoing, this would be possibly more for uh, um, a co corporate practice, but do you represent, you know, huge companies who are going to stay with you after the sale? Do you have client stickiness with all your clients? Do you have a great, I think it's similar to SEO. Do you have a great pipeline and onboarding practice methodology? And to the extent that you could systemize and sell that to other attorneys or other businesses and bring in a non-legal revenue, obviously that's gonna change your game. For example, I have a friend who's a very successful immigration attorney, but she also teaches I-9 training. So for people who are in, that's how to onboard employees and make sure they're compliant with immigration laws. So she teaches that to large corporations. So she has that stream of revenue. I have a family law attorney client, so she just launched a do-it-yourself online divorce practice for uncontested divorces. So in thinking how to strategically prepare yourself for selling later, adding some different types of revenue streams are helpful as well. So that kind of gets us off track, but. Mm. No, that's a great point because that's essentially diversification. Right. 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 So it's, it's not having all your eggs in one basket. So we have growth rate, the consistency of the marketing. We have gross revenue. So if a firm's doing over like a certain revenue number, they could get a higher multiple. We have client stickiness, and then we have diversified revenue streams. And I'd say last one are like, how did the financials look? Are you, do you have a, pro, a pro, high profit margin, low mm. debt? Um, Okay. Low, these are just, these continue to be like the due diligence items that you would look at. Low attorney turnover. Um, and I am happy to send a due diligence checklist that's law firm focused to anyone who'd be interested in that. I don't have it ready to upload in the chat, but I'd be happy to share that. It's very detailed. Like, is there a partnership agreement? Uh, what do the partners get paid? Um, what is often difficult for our firm with a lot of older partners is they have like these golden handcuffs that cost the young partners a lot of money. So there are a lot. So once you find that amazing firm that you think is a great cultural fit with your firm, you know, the due diligence starts. It's like getting in the weeds. Uh, to so wait, 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 can you slow down? I just want to I want to have this a, an action. So what were those things you just rambled off? Because they were key. You said something about partner stuff like I just yeah, like sure you can't say that like the younger partners are going to have to pay out the older partners so much that, you know, you're not going to be able to keep those young partners. That's often a problem with law firms when they merge or as the partnership ages, the older partners want to take out a lot to the detriment of the younger partners. Um, another issue that uh, uh, causes M&A in law firms to, to die or that one firm has a lot of debt and the new firm is not willing to take on that debt or it makes the deal unpalatable. Mm. So while they might have a lot of other good factors, some of these other uh, factors might cause um, the firm to you know, not be desirable. Maybe they have a large malpractice claim. Uh, maybe their earnings are inconsistent. Maybe they've had one great payout as a PI firm, but they have not had any more home runs. I mean, those kinds of things. Okay, so huge stuff here. If you had to, if you had to pick a few of these valuation items, which would be most important? My gut is that gross revenue is probably number one, I would assume. Like, like a $100 million law firm is, is going to have a lot more certainty behind its revenues than a, a smaller one. But so I, Gross revenues is probably very important, I would assume. I, is... I think culture is number one. Okay. If, you're, if it's a bad fit, it's not ever going to work. And integration will be impossible. Yeah. Very difficult and people will leave. And then I think second, gross income. And in like with any business, the larger the company, the higher the valuation is going to be. If you're a manufacturing company that's at a million dollars or a manufacturing company 
that's 100 million, those valuations are gonna be different. That's true in law firms as well.